happening here and what you think the cause or the factors are that are diminishing the sea ice? Well, you know, it's, they have a point. Um, it's not possible for any scientist to know everything about everything. And in science, uh, it's important that we be able to rely on our colleagues in other areas of specialty for, to provide us with sound information. And when a group of people come forward, like uh, 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 like in the IPCC, and, and say that there's a consensus that uh, we all the experts agree that anthropogenic global warming is a is a reality, and, and no serious person would ever say anything uh, uh, against it. They would have to be just some some crazy conspiracy theory person who's just like not really thinking clearly, right? You can understand where people who aren't experts in something like climatology might might be compelled to sort of say, well, if this is the best information that's accepted by this this international group that has you know government sponsored representatives, why? I mean, why should we doubt these projections if they're saying that they've got it all figured out and it's all true? But then you actually look at, like, what's happened the last 10 years. <laughs> Carbon dioxide has gone up. Globally, temperatures have not. I mean, it's, you start to wonder, well, is there a consensus? What is the science based on? What are the, the arguments that they're really drawing on for this? And uh, just because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a climatologist doesn't mean I can't read and I can't think about what I read. And so I began to read and I began to speak to people who work in this area. Um, I've attended a couple of conferences that were uh, 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 well attended by a number of researchers around the world, really. Uh, some of them national heads of government who don't agree with anthropogenic global warming, who don't feel that the, the full information is coming out, who don't feel that it's all cut and dry. And one thing I can say for absolute certainty is, is that this notion that there's a consensus on this issue is false. There's a lot of people who disagree and have good reasons for that. So I've been doing the best I can to learn about it, and, and yeah, I share what I learn. And, uh, you know, it may be my understanding is incomplete, but, uh, you know, I, I, I feel that it's important that all of us who are affected, as well as the ones doing the root research, uh, are part of the dialogue. There are technologies that exist that are being used to alter our atmosphere that are in force every day using technologies that were invented by Nikola's Tesla. And it's interesting when you talk about or think about whole systems, a whole systems approach to solving something or identifying what a problem is there are so many factors that are off the table, like warming, what would make something warm or melt? Well, frequency changes, electromagnetic interference, pollution via, you know, Tesla radiation technology used by government agencies. As a matter of fact, there's one in, in, uh, in Alaska called HARP. And they send billions of gigawatts of energy that destroys our ionosphere and other parts of our environment. And it's not even on the table of climate change or weather. And yet they're using weather modification technologies and the public is totally asleep. M much of the public is asleep. So when, you tr when one refers to causation, and because my area a focus is in whole systems, a whole systems approach to everything. When you have technologies that are being deployed that are not in the public mind of even knowing that they exist, and then you have a government apparatus that's saying that there's warming without the other factors on the table, and then everybody's scratching their head, why is the sea ice melting? Well, I think we, I, I think we're doing, a, I'm doing a separate show on this coming up on HARP and that technology that's used, which is not about this show. But it's interesting to me that a false attribute would be used to say it's this or it's that why the sea ice is melting. First of all, I didn't know that, in fact, 100% that was correct. So you're verifying that that's correct today. But 
there are all the the other part of it is that even some of the technologies that are being used and deployed and experimented with by our military are not even known to climatologists or meteorologists, uh, polar bear biologists, etc. And so there are things in the realm of physics that unless you bring a physicist on board as part of the overall climate and weather mix for a discussion, it's still incomplete. Do you see what I'm saying? Well, I do see what you're saying, and it, it sort of echoes what I was saying earlier, which is that you know most of us that are fully engaged in one aspect of one thing or another, whether it's climate or polar bears or systems research, it's very difficult to, to know what everyone else is doing and to fully understand it because there just isn't time. Right. Let's talk, let's talk a little bit about, or let's talk a lot about, what is in your heart to share with the public about your experience as a polar bear researcher who spent 31 years focusing on them? What do we need to know? Well, I guess the first thing I would, I would do is, is reassure uh, people that, uh, that, the, that the, the issues and the problems and the, and the dire forecasts and the bad pictures are not, are not things that are happening now or have happened in the past. Uh, there are some indications of uh, uh, sea ice issues that, that, that uh, have been sort of analyzed, and, and, and it appears that they've, been, they've caused, uh, for example, polar bears in the Beaufort Sea to have adult female survival rates that are only 80%. Um, but the actual, the actual decline in populations that has been detected is limited to only 260 animals in western Hudson Bay. Uh, everything else, all the other dire, dire predictions are essentially predictions that are based on these climate model forecasts. Can you say that again? Because that's very profound. Say it one more time. Well, if the, scientifically, if, there's no, if the confidence intervals overlap, then you can't say there's really a difference between population numbers at time T and time later, right? So the actual, the actual decline in numbers for all 19 subpopulations that, that have been documented is 260 bears, about 265, something like that, in western Hudson Bay. There have been no declines documented from actual uh, population enumeration methods uh, for the southern Beaufort Sea or the northern Beaufort Sea or uh, southern Hudson Bay, uh, uh, Davis Strait, uh, any of these other populations. So 260 animals from one population, that's it. That's what the whole panic is based on. Uh, Except that it's not the whole the whole panic. What the, what the panic is really based on is the notion that if what's been observed in these areas continues as the IPCC forecasts it will, then we'll see these things at some later date. So there there's lots of polar bears. There's no real probably and certainly the uncertainty is great enough that no one could really say if polar bears have even changed in numbers or not. Um, so those declines in that one population could easily have been made up by increases in another population for whatever reason, improved management of the harvest or improved conditions from global warming even because some of the areas that didn't have many polar bears because of heavy multi-year ice may be more favorable for polar bears now. But mostly that's just uncertainty because no one's really looked. It's, it takes a long time to do these uh, uh, research projects on polar bear populations. And uh, How long does it take? Well, really, it takes about six or seven years if you start out with the telemetry that you need to identify the population boundaries, and then you follow that with at least a three-year survey to get a, a population estimate and estimates of rates of birth and death. Then you can have a sense of if the population is increasing or declining, what the harvest ought to be. And for most of our populations, we, we, we have only one sort of a snapshot of that. We don't even have a second sort of a snapshot to see if things have changed. Um, a few of the populations that have had long-term research, like Southern Hudson Bay, and, or like Western Hudson Bay, and like uh, uh, Southern Beaufort Sea, uh, there there are issues with the sampling, which is there were logistic constraints that didn't allow the researchers to sample the whole area. For example, in, in, in the Southern Beaufort Sea, the researchers were only able to sample about half of the area based on the, the distribution of their radio collared animals. So they knew they weren't getting out and sampling all the bears, just the bears they could get to. And I mean, they're, they're putting their lives on their line to do that. It's a tough area to work, but, but is that information reliable? Is there really only 80% survival for adult females? Or could maybe that have been underestimated because some of those bears were just not available to be recaptured because they were too far offshore? Um, they argue that it's reliable. Uh, other people might argue differently, but 
But all I'm saying is that 